What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's your number one gamer ghoul, uh, running on a good three and a half hours of sleep. I don't know why. Sometimes that's just how it, how it happens. But you know what? That's also uh, how the magic happens sometimes when you reach this uh, desperate manic state uh, where you can really let loose with your creativity. Here's the result of my work so please and oh i'm getting a phone call hello mrs claude here can't come to the phone right now we're out looking at all the beautiful christmas lights and ice cream. you called me the thing is a third person action horror game developed by computer artworks and published by universal now vivendi games for pc in 2002 which had temporarily created a publishing wing under the name black label games it was probably an easier way of saying that but i i didn't work that out konami would publish console versions for xbox and playstation 2. i should mention that ps2 and xbox copies are relatively common and not as viciously scalped as some other games of its age but the pc version is at the time of this video abandonware this game is meant to function as a direct sequel to the 1982 film of the same name, which was itself a remake of 1951's The Thing from Another World, which itself was a film adaptation of the 1938 novel Who Goes There? The novel and both films deal with a group of Arctic researchers uncovering a frozen, shape-shifting alien life form and the paranoia that ensues as they attempt to destroy the thing and survive while cut off from the rest of humanity. In mid 2000s the project would be announced, optimistic about the game's chances and in the midst of a new console generation. It would also be announced for the GameCube and Game Boy Advance, though neither of those versions would materialize. Universal had chosen Computer Artworks to pitch an idea for the thing after their debut game Evolve was well received, and prior to it the team had primarily worked on visual effects for films like 1995's Hackers. as well as music videos for rave producers like The Shaman. Also, that's that's a young Jason Statham, by the way. Uh, look at this fucking guy. Look at him go. The team showed off a reskinned version of Evolve which impressed Universal, and by all accounts, they were given relative free reign to take the project wherever they wanted. Throughout the thing's development, several demos were shown off, building substantial hype for its novel gameplay ideas and impressive graphics. Director and self-proclaimed gamer John Carpenter even gave his blessing to the project and appears as a minor character in it. Despite the fear and trust system being a major selling point, computer artworks routinely made it clear that they intended the game to be more action-oriented, citing the current wave of Rockstar games as influences. Initially planning for a more open-world experience before it was pared down to the mostly linear experience we got. In their words, a lot a lot of the bigger aspirations with the game were diminished due to their misplaced confidence in the sixth generation of consoles. Even the game's lead designer laments that he overestimated what the PS2 and Xbox were capable of when initially setting out to design the game. They took one look at Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore and thought, well, clearly we can make our wildest dreams a reality. Tina. Reviews for the thing were mostly positive. IGN would opine, Resident Evil and Half-Life have a new half-brother. While Eurogamer would define it as, by no means a bad game, but it's all the more disappointing thanks to the fact that it could and should have been brilliant. It sold well enough for the dev team to move right into production on a sequel, one that would be closer to realizing the potential of the initial game, introducing more creatures, more dynamic NPC interactions, and even returning characters from the film. Your companions wouldn't just sprout grab your hands and run after you, they'd twist around and mutate, skittering around on the ceiling or developing massive jaws. Unfortunately, all that remains of this project are a handful of promo videos and concept art. Computer artworks, like a number of studios at the time, would quickly swell beyond sustainability, taking on too many projects and dissolving before they could complete another game. I think in a way, it's okay that that happened. They achieved 
their mission statement, making artwork with computers, and nobody can take that away. How many developers get to say they've created a masterpiece? Not many, I'd reckon. This is the price we pay for the Ikarian flight to genius. Just so you know, I am waiting for a call on the old Christmas hotline so I can tell Holiday Man what present I want under my solstice bush. So keep an ear out for that one for me, okay? Can you do that? Can you do that for me? Can you help me out? Can you be a pal? Get your head out of your ass. Thank you. I don't think it's entirely necessary to run through the plot of the film. It's a well-known film, and if you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch. The game's plot doesn't lean very hard on the plot of the film. I mean, what was there is kind of bare bones, and that's why it works. It's more about the claustrophobia and paranoia of it all, rather than having some deep, expansive lore. We're invested in this group of characters, and not so much the greater conspiracy afoot. The game picks up the story not long after the film's ending, when two U.S. Special Forces groups arrive to investigate the now-destroyed American research camp and the neighboring Norwegian camp, with Beta Team investigating the former and Alpha Team covering the latter. Beta Team is led by our protagonist, Captain J.F. Blake, a guy who is certainly a dude. It's not long before Blake's group is filled in on the events of the film. They find the alien craft, and even a message from McCready, Kurt Russell's character whose fate is still unknown. Which is a nice bit of symmetry because you see him making this tape in the film. Though they for some reason omit the most ominous line in it, but that's fine. Nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. What have you got? One body, identification says childs, no survivors. And what appears to be a... One body? And, 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 and what? And some kind of unidentified craft. It looks... Well, like a, a UFO. Colonel. 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 As they are being airlifted out, Blake decides to stay behind and meet up with Captain Pierce and Alpha Team at the Norwegian camp, seeing as though they've gone silent and he's just a good little boy, a good little soldier man. Maybe they need help. Bring him, uh, some, bring him some lunch or something? They're all dead. Everyone's dead. Fuck, dude. Well, not all of them are dead. They scattered after being attacked by thing creatures. Blake finds Pierce, who is already at peak paranoia, and demands that Blake take a blood test to prove he's still human before they go anywhere. He passes the test, uh, some others don't. And then the two set off to look for any other survivors and regain communication with the colonel. This reunion doesn't last uh, much longer than a couple seconds as the two immediately get separated in the blizzard and Blake is forced to move on without him. I'm assuming that's what happened. That seemed to all happen off screen. Or maybe I was just really focused on the podcast I was listening to while playing and not the game itself. Hey! Oh, holy shit. This isn't Joe Rogan. I'll give you an opportunity to opt out of further spoilers if you'd like to uh, skip to this time. You have approximately, uh, well, I don't know. I, I can't really define that yet. Whenever this segment is done, uh, what do you want to do in the meantime? You want, you want to cover some gamer news? Really date what would otherwise be a timeless creation? Let's see, uh... G-A-M-E-R-N-E-W-S. Ah, the makers of sci-fi sex game Subverse apologized after teaming up with a racist YouTuber. Oh boy, don't worry, you're in safe hands with me. I even blue-pilled myself in my previous video. Doom guys coming to fall guys. Uh... <coughs> I don't know who that is. Looks like this chair falls short of greatness. I don't know. Sure looks like a great chair. I don't think I've felt this empty in a while. Before Blake can make it to the radio, someone steals it and runs off. While in pursuit of the radio thief, we come across Pierce. See, this is where it gets kind of confusing because I feel like they misunderstood the lore of the movie because he's infected, quote unquote, like with a disease and he's going to turn into a thing monster, but like... That wasn't how it worked in the movie. It wasn't like uh, you're cognizant of it and you can do something about it. It was like you were completely replaced 
buy the thing. So, I mean, in a way it makes sense with what they wind up doing, but it's just, it's, it's just an odd moment. So if you can f forget for a second, you know, how this actually works, he's infected by a thing and uh, he has enough control to shoot himself before transforming into the thing properly. I mean, it's like, it's like a, it's like a fucked up scene, but it's confusing and that's all I could think about. Uh, anyway, the man we've been chasing after is revealed to be a large the thing. And after defeating it, or just walking past it like I did, Blake finds himself in a hidden lab beneath the Norwegian research station, run by a mysterious group called Gene Inc., and led by John Carpenter's uncredited cameo character Dr. Sean Faraday. They've been conducting experiments on the thing, and apparently come to the conclusion that this thing sucks. Freaking killed everybody. It's wrecking the place. Blake decides to escort Faraday out of the camp, but they are stopped by Colonel Whitley, who has no intention of letting them leave, revealing that he's far more privy to the events at both camps than he's led on, and both are dragged back to a secondary gene ink lab. Faraday attempts to destroy the remaining thing specimens in the lab, but Whitley explains that there is nothing to fear from the virus spreading. It's a virus now, as it can be controlled, and he is proof of that, having injected a modified strain of the virus into himself. Wasn't I don't think it was a virus before. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. That feels like a big thing to forget. Somebody will correct me. He does this in an attempt to cure his cancer. The, the specifics of how that could conceivably work don't seem to be all that important because uh, probably because he's a thing now. So why would anyone trust a thing you say? Okay, I kept seeing the word virus show up when I was researching this game, and even the dude who made the 2011 prequel seemed to consider the thing to be a virus, so I did a Twitter poll to avoid embarrassing myself, and it looks like the consensus is that it is not a virus. Also shout out to RJ McCready for liking my poll. I think it is hard to classify, so I, I still can't say this with much confidence, but I don't think it's so much a virus as a multicellular uh, fucker so if a person is infected that is a thing it's not glenn who has been infected by the thing it's just glenn thing now it's a creature who has this sort of a accumulative intelligence so you know you have a thing if you split that thing in half it's now two independently operating things it's like a living gack creatures having said that it is now a virus in the game's narrative. How that works exactly, I, I can only speculate. Faraday doesn't buy this compelling pitch and is shot by Whitley. Blake wakes up and attempts to escape the lab, which is actively being overrun by monsters, picking up breadcrumbs of exposition on the way. Learning that Gene Inc.'s presence here has been overseen by Whitley, who was having them synthesize the Thing virus, which seems like far more trouble than it's worth. Also, it just seems like our villain's motivations are very unclear. Does he want the virus to make it to the other parts of the world or does he want it as some kind of controlled weapon or, or does he want it for medicinal reasons? Because this thing doesn't seem to be able to behave in a predictable, controllable way. I think it's proven time and time again that we cannot in fact control it. But that's what Whitley's planning to do to some nefarious end. Spread the virus globally using a series of planes loaded with the stuff. Blake manages to escape the lab, fight through a squad of black ops soldiers, and destroy the planes before they can take off, finally facing off with Whitley at the side of the UFO, where, surprise, he turns into a giant, uncontrollable, fleshy, Lovecraftian monster. Coincidentally, a mysterious helicopter shows up to lend Blake a hand. And they explode the big lumpy arm and fly off and the pilot is Kurt Russell in a hat. I guess, dude. Anyway, you can come back now. The Thing story is really hard to follow, not because it's too complex or convoluted, more so that it's just so ephemeral that it becomes background noise to the shooting and exploding. The movie was built off, you know, tension and atmosphere, and there appears to be a genuine intention to mirror this that completely does not do that, aiming for the iconography of the film instead of its themes. 
most of what they set out to do in this regard and hyped up in every interview they could score is not here. That promise is not met. I can see your engagement with the story and world here being heightened if you're a big fan of the movie and you want to see that honored in some way, but it's handled with all the guile of a licensed arcade machine, like a child playing with the Thing action figures. And then McCready shows up and says, yeah, fuck you too, dude. And then these guys get superpowers and then they kiss. You know, the story has a nostalgic charm to it, hearkening to a simpler time for video games. Um, but it also means that it's not good. <laughs> And I don't think you can entirely blame the hardware for that. Games been having tension and atmosphere. Like, there are games from previous generations that understand tension. Games that have made me cry. When I saw the opening cutscene for Nightmare Creatures 2, I was sobbing because I felt like someone just understood my vibe for like the first time. How about a new album? No way, bro. How about any art I ain't doing nothing. But I think it might boil down to the direction they were aiming for in the beginning of production. I'm real skeptical of things that aim for action horror and would cite Grand Theft Auto 3 as an influence. It's not an impossible mixture, but it's, it's a bit like oil and water. These two things don't want to be together, and you'd have to be a real smarty pants to make that work. And it's, it's kind of endearing exploring areas that are meant to be replicas of locations in the film, and there are little bits of dialogue that nod to bits of dialogue in the film. And then we ran into a Swede. Norwegian. Yeah, the Norwegian guy. Hey, Sweden! Not Swedish, man, the Norwegian. They clearly watched it and enjoyed it. The Thing film has these badass characters and intense body horror monsters, but I've never thought of it as an action experience, and I don't think that was the right ingredient to favor, especially since it seems like they were selling the idea that this would be similar to the film's tone. A tone that was slow, nihilistic, and mysterious. It was every bit a psychological struggle as it was a physical one. It's great watching the characters come to understand the Thing properties and abilities and finding creative means to combat it or spectacular ways to fail to combat it. The movie was mostly in a bottle with people arguing with each other about who might be a thing and who might not be a thing and then every once in a while it would erupt into body horror and somebody would get set on fire and some people didn't want to burn each other. There was difficulty in processing the situation. McCready, I know Bennings. I've known him for 10 years. He's my friend. Some of them aren't even a thing and they go banana brains. And that was the good part. I mean, in my opinion, I like the gory monster shit, but it's it earns those moments with the other stuff. What this game is going for is big. It's more Hollywood than the film was. Now we're left with taking the film's climax and just pausing it there. So that's all we're getting for the whole seven or so hours. Minus the parts near the end that are just G.I. Joe bullshit. It makes for some occasionally enjoyable gameplay, but a deeply unnoteworthy story. I wouldn't know exactly how you would portray this kind of story in a PS2 era game and not have it be some kind of telltale type game centered around people arguing, but I don't know. F figure it out. Figure it out almost two decades ago, please. You know what? It's, it's honestly just criminal that they had free reign with this project and didn't let you play as this guy. You make a game about a movie starring the coolest fucking guy and you give us this piece of uncanny plywood to play as? Who is this dude? What's his deal? Where does he go in between loading screens? We can't know if he is who he says he is. The thing, for the most part, plays like your average third-person shooter at the time, with a few attempts at innovation thrown into the mix. Just to jump right into the game's central disappointment, uh, it's dynamic, immersive, quote-unquote squad-based, quote-unquote combat, and fear trust system is not exactly what was promised. There is a residual charm to its novelty, it's obviously a neat idea, and it's entertaining for a while seeing it in action, especially considering the game's age and considering it's not a mechanic 
that many developers would attempt even now. Having your teammates uh, vomiting on dead bodies, pissing themselves, killing themselves, shooting at you, or turning into a monster. These are all the most entertaining things. Staples of amusement, I think. Uh, but b beyond the first areas of the game, it becomes more and more clear how hollow its execution was. You can have up to three NPCs follow you around with different roles, like engineer and medic, and they have three levels of trust, normal, scared, and pissing. If they are in the pissing stage, you need to find some means of stopping them pissing, or they will kill themselves or turn hostile. Very cool concept, but their function is, as far as I can tell, more or less uh, completely scripted and necessary for progression. It's predetermined which of your characters will turn into monsters and when that will happen. And if one of them dies at the wrong time, it's a game over. So it's not like you stumbled upon a companion and you gained an advantage by keeping them alive and making them repair a fuse box or something. You needed to do that. That was the only option. Even though Blake seems fully capable of doing that himself when the plot calls for it. There's some creativity in how the NPCs react to stressful environments. It's genuinely a neat touch of design. But this mechanic seems to mean so little. They could be freaking out, vomiting in horror one moment, and then say, on a dime, I'm okay sir, I just pissed, it's just some piss sir. I don't feel entirely responsible for their survival because they'll either die when the game has planned for them to die, or I'll move to the next area and they just won't show up. Like, they'll just be gone. I feel like if we were all taken this seriously, we, we would have stuck together. But in order to perpetuate this loop, they have to inelegantly wipe the slate clean in every new area. I like that you need to interact with them to heal and give them ammo and that you can gain their trust by giving them a weapon or showing that you're not infected. But their trust is just a binary thing that decides whether or not they attack you. It's hard to ignore how squandered an idea it is. Sometimes I wish I could take control of my squad because they are morons uh, and I just want them to do anything other than whatever the fuck they're doing. We got please dude, please get inside. Yeah, there's one part, one, where you come across two characters that are arguing and accusing the other of being infected and you walk up to one of them, you give them a blood test and one of them will be revealed to be a monster and I wish there was more of that. I feel like that would require these dudes to actually hang around and do more than the limited bits of interaction they're capable of. What if there was an option to just like talk to them? Like, uh, hey, what's what's your name, dude? Do you like... Uh, you? you play overwatch give him give me something to make your inevitable death meaningful oh he's a hanzo main Even though I'm not a fan of how relentless this game's action can be, I did appreciate that it was occasionally quite frantic and couldn't always be overcome by pumping bullets into everything. The smaller enemies and humans can be taken care of in this manner, but the bigger manifestations of the thing are only weakened by bullets and need to be set on fire to be properly killed. There are other small, commendable challenges that aren't just shoot waves of enemies, even though there is plenty of that. There are occasionally some very light puzzles, but most of the time what's impeding your progress is having to find a key. The escape sequence is probably when the game feels the most varied as far as gameplay. I felt like I was using my head for a little bit. I might be able to deactivate the security gate with the correct switch sequence. and the presence of my squad was a relief. Uh, otherwise, I don't think it's a prohibitively difficult game, so much as some of its design can be unfairly obtuse. Boss fights don't do a great job of telegraphing what you're supposed to be doing, or aiming for, or if you're actually damaging it. And like most of them are the same thing you fight 
multiple times. It's just... Save points are usually plentiful, but occasionally set between these long combat sections that I would not want to have to replay. When this would happen, I would be so disappointed. And you could die so quickly in this game. It's mostly just funny, really. Maybe that speaks to uh, the state I reached from being tired of repeating sections of the game. But you'll just walk into a room and blow up sometimes. <laughs> Fucking up. What's there to be afraid of? Look, it's just a flying saucer like on TV. There are environmental dangers, like you can't stand outside in the freezing cold for too long, but there aren't too many times that it would benefit you to press your luck exploring an area and risking death from exposure. Surviving in the Arctic is its own avenue of gameplay that could have been explored but is ultimately represented by this bar. You don't let the bar go down or you'll die. There are also a lot of just odd annoyances in the design, like when you die there's no load game option. You can restart the level or go to the main menu and it's like nothing it's, it's such a small thing but because of that it's astounding to me that nobody thought to add after years of production just load your fucking game the thing you're gonna do most likely you're telling me this whole time nobody wanted to load a save after they died nobody nobody wanted to not have to restart the game nobody no the Thing is a perfectly serviceable looking game. There isn't a lot of detail I could go into as far as its visuals. Everything about it has this kind of budget film tie-in aesthetic. Running around outside shows off some decent atmosphere with the billowing snow and intense darkness. The rest of the environments don't really require much beyond steel grating and concrete walls. Not offensive to look at, just sort of typical and unnoteworthy. Character models are oddly sort of fun. I, I, I like them. Um, they are antiquated in comparison to other games released that year. Uh, they're clearly just digital photos of people's faces with a hole cut out for their mouth to flap around. I, I don't know, I, th I thought it was really fun for some reason. Voice acting is amazing, probably top tier, up there with the greats. Not a lot of big names on the call sheet here. If I had to guess, I'd assume most of the roles were given to members of the dev team, as most of these people seem to have the thing as their only acting credit. And, you know, that's what it sounds like. Jesus, help me! Look, I can only help you if you get your shit together. Now tell me what you know. Who's the cargo for? I don't know, but it sure ain't the Red Cross. Uh, weirdly enough, Cam Clark, probably most known for voicing Liquid Snake in the Metal Gear Solid franchise, appears in an uncredited role as the medic in your first throwaway squad. If any of you take on any damage, get back to me ASAP and I'll help you out. I'm not carrying any dead bodies back. The only other noteworthy voice actor goes to Colonel Whitley. He's played by William Davis, who played the smoking man in X-Files, though I'm sure most of you are probably more familiar with him when he essayed the role of college professor in Supernatural Season 1, Episode 11, entitled Scarecrow. Also, stay tuned for my upcoming series where I deconstruct every episode of Supernatural one by one. This is a thing I'm going to do. I promise you. I pro- That's probably um, what I found to be the coolest thing about this game. I like his voice, and having that moment of realization was the closest to fun I really experienced. But first, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask for your weapons. I'm not doing anything until I get some goddamn answers. You're out of your league here, Blake. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of things to say in this segment. Uh, I hope they gave my dude a nice little paycheck. He deserves it for being one of the great TV creeps. Maybe that's where all the budget went. I, I don't know where else it would have gone. I don't think there was a soundtrack. <laughs> um, I'm positive there's no music in this game. No, I mean, there probably is. I just, I just could, could tell you what it sounded like. Also, not counting the licensed end credits track by American new metal act Saliva which is bad.
Is this the vibe of the thing? Could you put this song in the film? It's a bad song. It's bad. You might even say it's uh, not good. <gasps> Holiday Man. Merry Christmas, friend. Now is the time for communion. Ascension. Holiday Man is coming. Ascension is coming. Gather, assemble, leave your doors unlocked. Lay still for the coming of the Holiday Man. This is the way it has always been. Friend. Uh, Holiday Man, it's it's me. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your schedule. Uh, you who are most stealthy. Uh, you who are immeasurably uh, undetectable. I would just like to say that I would like an EMF meter under my solstice bush. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Praise to you. Praise to the Ascension. Okay, bye. This is a game you should get because it will scare you to shit. Never play this game at night. Some parts are a little hard at times, but very fun. But sometimes your squad will blow their heads off, but it's all good. Very, very addicting. I wish you could slow down time like in Max Payne. Don't buy this game if you are a pussy. If you are, you will hate it and maybe try to blow your head off like that guy that gave this game a two. Hope you liked my report. Well, I guess uh, we know why I didn't really like it. And I don't know who this guy is that gave the game a two, but I hope he's okay. He sounds like a smart man. This game is hot. <laughs> Anyone who says otherwise has a fucking twing in their brain. I liked this game a loath. Only downside is that some of the bosses, like boss three, are extremely hard to kill. You thought the third boss was hard? I just stood in front of it and shot at it. Did I do it wrong? Is this the twing in my brain acting up? Was that the third boss actually? You fight Grabby Man, and then you fight Grabby Man again, then you fight Big Grabby Man. <laughs> Maybe he's talking about that one. That one was even easier. I would rather have cancer than play this game ever again. I mean, this game is so terrible. The only reason I gave it a one was the satisfaction I got from taking it out of my PS2, dropping it in the toilet, pulling down my pants, and all over it, then letting it set there for three months. I mean, don't even rent the f***ing thing, you stupid mother f***er. Oh, Jim. Look, I understand your feelings about the game. Trust me, I do. But there's no reason to allow the game to, to put your facilities out of order for three months. And you know what? There's no reason for you to go so blue. Your impassioned negative review was all that was required. So I sincerely hope you didn't go through with this and you're merely expressing your displeasure in a colorful manner. Graphics are amazing. Story is good and the gore is good. Anyone who doesn't like this game, okay. Okay, whoever says this game is rubbish is a knob. This game hasn't got any major problems at all. It's well good actually. I'm sensing a theme here with many of these reviews where we are sort of resorting to name calling and schoolyard language. I don't know if that is simply a reflection of the demographic that really enjoyed this game or it's just that this was the early 2000s which was something of a gamer dark age. But this game has many problems. The most severe being that it's just kind of all around mediocre when video games in both horror action and action horror were accomplishing many great things. Uh, this came out next to Silent Hill 2, Clive Barker's Undying, Devil May Cry, Soul Reaver 2, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, Eternal Darkness, and Blood Rain, and that's just the vaguely spooky ones. That's that's a lot of things I'd rather be playing. The game The Thing is great, thanks, have not opened Gods of War, Raymond. <laughs> For a second I thought you were addressing someone named Raymond, but I see now that you're talking about the game Gods of War Raymond. I hope you opened up that bad boy because you're in for a treat, my guy. I'm I, I didn't have a great time with the thing. I didn't find it to be a great horror game or action game or game. It doesn't really know how to write for it. It's just a gauntlet of shootouts that gets stale pretty quick. There aren't any characters to latch on to. The only reoccurring character is the protagonist who is nobody and the villain who's kind of fun because I recognize his voice. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why when given the permission to do anything, he didn't let me play as cool guy. I don't know, it just it seems like an obvious bit of wish fulfillment that might have made things more interesting. The plot is humorously uninventive like a cheesy 80s 
comic book or something. Bad man want do bad thing, stop bad man doing the bad thing. The gameplay doesn't come close to fulfilling its promise, which was already kind of dubious to begin with. Now there's a medical kit near the kennel. You go get it and come back here, and I'll watch you do the test. It squanders its good ideas and replaces them with you know, unknowworthy busy work. It, it isn't an experience all that worth revisiting uh, for me. For a long time in the formulating of my thoughts, I really tried to focus on the positive here, but I don't think this is a very good game. I'm sure there are tons of ardent defenders of it, maybe. Actually, I'm not sure. I'm frequently surprised by the games that people uh, enjoy. It's almost like we, we have different uh, interests, which isn't bad most of the time. I think the kindest thing I can say about it is that I see why it stood out to those who enjoyed it. For a licensed film adaptation, you could do a lot worse, and you could have a team that cared far less for the property they were adapting. On paper, computer artworks made a lot of good calls, at least in the conceptual stages. I think it was a good idea to serve as a sequel, implementing experimental gameplay mechanics that reflected the film's strengths. You know, but also attempting to provide a new experience. It meant well, but didn't result in a very exceptional game. The first time I played it, it was a rental. I had it for a few days, probably finished it early as it's not an exceptionally long game, and then immediately forgot about the experience. Playing it again, I understand why. Were video game rentals still an option? That's what I'd suggest, you know, if you were interested in playing it. It's, it, it is worth the rental. rental. Worth the rental. rental. You've reached the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. There are other videos you could watch as well. Please uh, see the description for a variety of links to various ways of supporting me or uh, further exploring my content. Hope you're doing okay. I'm a little cold. Uh, stay, stay safe. Stay goth. Stay gaming. Uh, if, if, if you're playing Cyber Flunk, <laughs> uh, make sure to take some breaks. I'm kidding, it's a fun game. <sighs> Once you get past the uh, guilt of playing it. Anyway, special thanks to patron name Speedrun. I apologize in advance if your name is Polish. Ailing Uncle Charles Ma. Fuck, <laughs> already fucked it up. Ailing Uncle Charles Mar, Matt Bastard, Resurrection, Game Master. Bayard Brown, this deal is getting worse all the time, Nazim Kamalu Ray, News Time, Karen Mavel, Dark Raptor 86, Oisto, Alexander Sundan, Octo, Joseph Zanoni, Dos Days, Pizza Shift, Daphne Pittendridge, Jacob Sewers, Ridley the Savior, Andre Perkins, Stuka Bliat, Fart Mother, Moon Picks, Carrot, Whip It Out, Turts, Crimson Dark, Ruibi Somem, Ben L, Gody McGork, David Badzinski, Ken Dog, Jay, Ava Nerve, Giraffa, Andre Kalganov, Sergey Voronsov, P. Dizzle, Ophelia Fishwife, A Hanging Chad, Donut Stalker, Simon Murray, Brozoof Jones, Ishanji, Rose, Persian Air, Sorenphil, Spooky, Mandalore Gaming, David Harpstrite, Dan Cullen, E. Dazed Clockwork. Edward Crawford, Brendan McFadden, Travis Houston, Hannes Jacoby, Big Honk, Tyler Robinson, Honey BB, Robert Scotland, Nunu, M, Nick Timmons, Tommy Steenrod, Day Yang, Jake Desi, Brody Gibson, Alistair Stewart, Niles D. McDonald, Marcus Chaney, Junk Food, Robert, Ombud, Thomas Hassey, Thurkildson, Aubrey, League of Struggle, Commissar, Doxapine, Vlastan, Picrosha, Arshus Knight, Spider, Leland Miliokis, Alas Ratgunk, Atlantean Goldfish, Sergei Vidovin, Roddy Rowdy Peeper, Major Millions, Tyler F., Mr. Boo Jangles, Evo Zap, Alec Galler, Strakinya Rodenkovic, Dan Richardson, Fred Gryson, Otter Soldier, Lost Via Domus, Megan Carmody, DJ Necroman, Meme Queen, Jay Marshall, Joe Face, El Jazguar, Sweetie Petey in the Back, CD, Declan J. Keen, Totally Not a Mimic, Michael King, Noilez, Roland, Petrus Montanu, Q Chan, Jean Philippe Malouin, Nicholas Nelson, Steinuel, Fazy, Vivitis, Ross Armstrong, Byron Callan, Callum May, Grimbeard and Narrow are my two dads, Rourke McKenzie, Austin Scott, Keith Pitt, Brianna Maria McKenzie, Lucas Kettner, Nikita Denisov, Mr. Sark, Dylan Sorum, Daniel Person, Brendan Naftal, Jojo Evans, Colton Rowe, Zubertuber, Sebastian Wappler, Sean Clausen, Omar Eid, Calavera, Bindle, Chris Jordan, Tomas Pelican, Zdienek Benez, our attack, 
Dr. Commissar, Colin Boyd, Bubblegum Kirapop, Trenton Wilkins, Big Cheese 1000, Justin Stewart, David Offord, Scoss 117, Homeboy Dirtbag, Brett Weaver, Nuan Sonar, Mystical Lint, AJ, James Young, Mangy Mongrel, Tyler Long, Crispy, Adam Page, AI, Mike Garza, Yak Spiker, Khalil Corey, Chris Tallarico, Spicy Milkan, 4 Hour Depression Nap, Oscar Alonzo, Nick Hill, Anna XO, Void, Ya Boy Nikki G, Stoyan, Roy Gendron, Pen Knight 89, Catherine Okada, James Stark, Jackson Burgess, Very Soft Machine, Dilda, Ignacio de Guglielmi, David Moreau, Sir Aloha Mora, Eris Alessandrakis, Pedro Costum, Adventure Game Geek, Ghost LPs, Niles Cray 19, Johan Kvand, Adrian Fachi, Christopher White Schneider, Ricky Goss, Pixelfish, Wednesday V, Alex Hanna, Professor Nex, Lucas, Cassiel, Alex Blackwood, No Bunny, The Gaming Beehive, Little B, Drunk Taco, Matthias Waltman, Ricky Rigatoni, Robert McMahon, Hashi Singh, Jared, AJ Leroy, Brad, Anthony Daniel, Jonathan Becker, Sam C, Warhopper, Kevin Thurber, The Super Pickle, Sir Prize, The Voyant Claire, Gargantua, Joe Reynolds, Melon Man, Level Zero, Sven Grell, Grimbeard but with bananas taped to his hands, Schluff, OK Cat Dad, Tess Dunn, Yoni Niamela, Another Homeboy Dirtbag, either you did this twice or there are two of you and you now have to fight for your name, Crampic Newt, Tiana Lazik, Big Dong Daddy Dom, Razzle Dazzle B13, Uncle Dozer TV, Dignity D7187, Kanum, Wabuktis, Slavic Dreams, Phony Soprano, Yef, Stephen Francisco Santana, The Becker Sattler Clan, Piotr Zonkowski, Nameless, Alexis Pinsenalt, Jacek Kotarba, Visitor Information, Nichols Monroe, Gato Malo, Val Halverson, Vincent Cronin, Rith, Sinoise, Seaway Jerk, Christian Danny Storgard, T Stoney, Alex Stutson, Solarbox, Austin Mathis, Dredged, Odd One Indeed, A.L. Carpenter, Ian Laser, or Lasser, or maybe Laser, because Laser sounds cool. Stephen LaFlame, also a cool name. Tony Gleed, LaFazer, Bones Malones, Nagru, Matt Chester, Ikifu, Michael B, Onkel, Sean Bradford, This It For, Lewis Quinn Whalen, Eugene Balder, Zan, Eric Leong, Vu Krulez, Daniel Newberry, Sweeneasy, Bim Bizzle, Viet Doe, Astro Shepard, Pentagon Black, Dust Sucker, Michael Sapka, Conrad Eastman, Oliver Marshall, Luke Gasway, Furin, Pagan Butler, Korn, Inside My Strange Place, Korn, Followed by Inside My Strange Place. Worked out pretty well. Uh, Brandon Shock, Sam Fuller, Cloister 56, Yossarian, Allegory, Lucas Mendel, Stray Dog Freedom, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Rasmus Karras, Deveith Faust, Silvano Gonzalez, Ian Huayli, Mr. Roboto, John Adams, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Ian Baranek, Florian Vogel, Bertie Bertig, Rachel Rose, Vinculus, Avalanche Reviews, Negative Creep, Alex Theodoroff, Chris Barb, Sean Lovett, Haimo Statman, Boyi, HL Longboy, Manu Weidman, Danny D, Tony Brandt, Joshua Stewart, Curano, Chef Toker, QL2040, Gideon Joubert, Scott Motus, Frand, Vey, Peachy Pixel 8, Sir Tristan, Sarah Denman, Stanislav, Casey Ghoul, Zachary Schulstad, Krylar, Ross Carmona, Kalifos, Sammy 3D, Mikey Tamarine, Schwabalaba, Monolith, Moral, Daniel Gen, Demar, Unpolished Mirror, John Stone, Frantic Atlantic, Jick Magger, Hamish Batten, Mara Alina, Jacob Hanley, Octo, Raul Vidal, Josh Hessler, Cam, Pommy, Nylanthrope, Emil Johansson, Alex Yu, Prod Mage, Van the Cheesen, Nick Johnson, Franz, Leonardo Antonio Aquisanta, Gaday, Buckaroo, Who Done It, Bertigan, Danteg K3, Frank, Eric Lawn, Yui, Low C, Azroy, Ziklau, Andre Korenkov, Edward Wheeler, Someone Finally Pays Me, Ren, Quirky Top Hat, Bit Matter, Love You More, Lauren, Jacob Gardner, Zane Brake, Dead Ale Wives, Robert Janowski, Cannon Go Boom, Emmett Arthur, Pager, and PJ. Thank you for being a patron. Also, Patron just updated how they list these, so I noticed there was some uh, doubles in there. I don't know if more than one of you had the same name, or if uh, they've just still not made this uh, as easy as I need it to be. But thank you for supporting me. I'm immensely thankful. St stay tuned. Lots of content coming your way. I appreciate you. Please don't leave me. Be sure to praise Holiday Man um, if you would like something put under your solstice bush. 
happy times. Well, I'm a sick little baby, yeah. The way I pace back and forth alone.